So, hello there, and welcome back to yet another Night of the Movies podcast. And in these podcasts, I talk all things movies and TV, and whatever I want, whenever I want. And in today's podcast, I am reviewing Polar Express. The Polar Express. But, just before I do that, I should say what I say at the start of every podcast I do, which is, if you are watching this podcast on YouTube, hello to my viewers, but if you prefer to listen to your podcast on Spotify, well, you can look, as you can also listen to this podcast on Spotify at Night of the Movies on that platform, and if you are already listening to this podcast on Spotify, hello there to podcast listeners, then you can also watch this podcast visually, yes, you can watch this podcast on YouTube at Night of the Movies on that platform as well. Likewise, wherever you may be watching or listening to the podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the podcast, of course, and please leave me with some feedback on things to improve on in future podcasts because there are always things to improve on and feedback is, as ever, much appreciated. So, let's get into it. The Polar Express. So, I decided to review this as my Christmas movie for 2023, because every year on this channel I talk about Christmas movies that I've released in the past, which I absolutely love, and this year I am doing the same right now. I love Pole Express, and that's why I decided to talk about it today, because of how much it holds a special place in my heart. I'm going to move back a bit. Yeah, how much it holds a special place in my heart, because one of my earliest memories is on a Christmas, I don't know, 10, 12, 11 years ago, watching this on Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas, uh, this is the last thing I watched before I went to bed, and just, it, it filled it me with excitement, it filled me with a wonder, and it got me just so excited for Christmas morning. I remember going to bed after watching this film for the first time and eagerly awaiting what Santa was going to bring for me the following morning. That is why the film has always held a special place in my heart and will probably continue to because I watch it every Christmas because even though I'm at an older age now than when I first watched the film, I try and watch it every Christmas because it reminds me of what it's like to be a kid at Christmas again and to have that excitement and wonder as to what you're going to get on Christmas morning. And I just love that about it. I mean, there are problems with this film. I'm not going to say there isn't. And I can completely understand why someone would, would you know, watch it for the first time now and completely... and you know, and take a very big dislike into it. I can understand why some people just wouldn't like it when it first came out. I mean, the CGI animation, it was all done through motion capture technology. You know, if you look behind the scenes, a lot of it is Tom Hanks in this motion capture uh, costume, this motion capture suit, and he's doing all the movements of all the characters. And, you know, I can tell where some, I can tell where the CGI would lose people because the human characters in this film look unearthly at times. They don't look like humans and I don't know if the CGI animation has held up that well if I'm being completely honest. I get what they were going for and I admire what they were going for. I'm all for trying different and new types of filmmaking but at the same time I'm not sure if it totally works and the train ride that we go on to get to the North Pole in the film makes absolutely no sense to a section of the film which are clearly dedicated for a 3D screen because this film does release in 3D in certain cinemas around you know every year around Christmas and I'm pretty sure it released in 3D when it initially came out in 2004 and I'm not sure if some of the roller coaster aspects of the film work particularly well. I don't really know what's going for there. And the elves in the third act of the film, when you get to the North Pole, a lot of the elves sound like characters out of the Sopranos. They have that sort of Sopranos kind of accent, and I'm not sure if that totally works. And a lot of the film, pacing-wise, is all over the place. It's actually quite a messy film, and it's got a lot of big problems. And I don't know if it's held up too well ever since releasing almost 20 years ago now. You know, this one was 19 years old this year, and I'm not sure if it's held up particularly well with the CGI animation on the version of the film that I watched, because maybe they've updated the film since it first released. I, I would... I would bet money they probably have, but at the same time, though, I watched the DVD version of this that I've had 
well, that my family's had since as long as I can remember. And yeah, the CGI animation just, I don't know, it doesn't totally work though. That being said, I don't care about all the problems. I don't care about all the problems that this film has because it's just so wildly entertaining in my opinion and it feels so Christmassy. As soon as the film begins, I am into the world of Polar Express. You get the Alan Silvestri musical score immersing you into the world of the film and Tom Hanks is just wonderful voicing all of the adult characters in the film, or almost all of the adult characters. He doesn't voice the mother in the main family that we follow, but he voices the father in the main family, he voices Santa Claus, he voices the conductor on the train, he voices the ghostly man who lives on top of the train, he voices all these different characters in the film, and I think he does such a great job. And Tom Hanks can sing! You know, this film has musical moments, it has some musical moments to it, and one of my favourite aspects of this film, which is completely unnecessary by the way, but I don't care, because it's one of my favourite aspects, and that is the Hot Chocolate song, you know, bum bum, oh we got it, bum bum, oh we got it, bum. here we only got one wool, here we only got one wool, never ever let it cool, I love that song, you know, I only really listen to it around Christmas, but it's also... Um, the type of song which you can listen to outside of Christmas and I, I just think it's a really really great song and it gets stuck in my head as soon as I hear it, as soon as I sing it because literally just singing it then it's stuck in my head now and I love that song so so much and continuing on with the music I love 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 the musical score for this film i think it's actually better than the film i think this is one of those instances where the musical score actually exceeds the film and you can and uh, yeah i think it's far i think it i think the musical score itself makes the film far more christmasy and far more um wonderful and so and far more entertaining than it has any right to be the musical score is perfect because it's quoting and it's riffing on all these classic Christmas carol tunes that we hear around this time of the year played by brass bands around the UK if you live in the UK or just you know the classic Christmas carol tunes that you hear all the time this the score of this film quotes a lot of that but also most importantly the score um, has a lot of New and unique themes though. Themes that I don't think have been matched in any other musical scores for any other Christmas films. I mean, I really like the musical score for Elf, and I just rewatched that in the cinema recently, and I think John Devaney's musical score for that film is very good, and I think the music for Muppets Christmas Carol is simply just brilliant. It's absolutely beautiful, the music for that film. But I think the music for this film is so on point because you can just listen to the score itself and you get the feeling of Christmas. Just simply in the score itself, you know. Every single time I hear that little motif from the score, I get the feeling like it's Christmas. You know, and there's not many musical scores that can do that. I'd actually put it in the same league as John Williams' Star Wars scores or Howard Shaw's Lord of the Rings scores, where you can listen to the musical score outside of the film and your mind is instantly taken back to the film itself or your mind is instantly taken back to the feeling you had watching the film and that's what I get from the musical score I listen to the score I listen to this track called The Sweet from Pole Express on Spotify and it feels like Christmas it feels like Christmas just like that when I listen to the musical score you know when I get to late November and I'm not quite feeling Christmassy I can listen to the musical score for this film and I just I'm there Christmas has arrived for me. Christmas has arrived for me when I listen to Alan Silvestri's musical score for this film. Also, it sounds like an Alan Silvestri score. You know, because Alan Silvestri, people don't know, he did the score for such other films as Back to the Future, Forrest Gump. Um, one of my recent scores he did was Ready Player One. He also did the score for the Avengers movies. I'm pretty sure he didn't do the score for the second Avengers film, but he did the score for the first Avengers film. 
um, Infinity War and Endgame. So he's done a lot of famous scores. And I think you can tell this is an Alan Silvestri musical score. And I mean that in the best way possible. I think he just does an absolutely magnificent job with the musical score for this film. I think the musical score is better than the film itself. And I think it makes the film so, so much better. Um, the film is Diets by Robert, Robert Zemeckis. Any people uh, recognise that name? Robert Zemeckis previous Diets the films such as the Back to the Future trilogy, and I enjoy all three of those films, by the way. The first Back to the Future is simply perfect, but I really like Back to the Future 2 and 3. I just rewatched them recently. I think they're far better films than people give them credit for, and also he directed Castaway, Forrest Gump, and he directed the Jim Carrey Christmas Carol film. You know, the fully CGI animated one, which actually has a similar sort of animation to this film. You know, and so people might be going, people might be wondering, why do you like, why does the CGI animation in this film not bother you as much as a CGI animation in A Christmas Carol? In Jim Carrey's Christmas Carol, because I have spoken about this on the channel in the past, I even did a review of that version of A Christmas Carol, the one with Jim Carrey, but I don't like that film, and the CGI in that film is really off-putting. But here's why the CGI isn't off-putting for me in this film. Because the story and the characters and the journey and the sense of wonder and the Christmassy feel of this film makes it bearable, makes the CGI animation bearable because I can get past all that. You know, when you look at that CGI animated version of A Christmas Carol starring Jim Carrey, I'm watching I'm thinking, I can't get past the CGI and I've seen better versions of this film done before, of this story done before. Muppets Christmas Carol is definitively the best version of A Christmas Carol. You know, I heard somebody say this this Christmas and I think it's absolutely true. Muppets Christmas Carol is, to people who were born after 2000, um, it's a wonderful life to them. You know, people who who are over middle aged now say that It's a Wonderful Life is the best Christmas film of all time. And I do think it's one of the best Christmas films of all time. But I think for people who are born past the year 2000, Muppet's Christmas Carol is there. It's a wonderful life, if you follow my thinking. And so, yeah, I think Muppet's Christmas Carol is absolutely brilliant. I don't, I don't think Polar Express is as good as Muppet's Christmas Carol. But for me, again, it holds such a special place in my heart because... Polar Express embodies everything that Christmas is for me. The music, the the Christmassy elements of the film, this whole myth of believing in Santa, because even though now, and if you don't know already, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, have to break the myth for you, but um, yeah, Santa isn't real. Santa isn't real, but then I watched, it, I watched this film and I believe in Santa again. Even though I know now that he's not there anymore. Even so I know now that, you know, and it's always a bit heartbreaking when the myth is broken for you, by the way. Because, I don't know, it, I think it takes a bit of the magic away from you. But then I watch this film and it does make me feel the Christmas magic. And it still makes me believe in Santa, which is a big plus. Because, again, going back into what I was saying, the film embodies everything about Christmas for me. It really does, to the point that I, I do try and make it an annual thing every year to watch this film. In fact, I didn't watch this film last year, and it didn't feel like Christmas to me until Christmas Day. And I'm really annoyed that I didn't do that. I mean, last year I was writing all these essays because in my final year of uni, and perhaps that was why I just didn't really have the time, but... It really didn't feel like Christmas to, to me until I got to Christmas Day last year. Whilst I watch this film now and the Christmas feel is really upon me. You know, I, I was already feeling Christmassy beforehand. I'd listened to the Alan Silvestri musical score, but now I've watched the film. I'm like, yeah, Christmas is coming, people. <laughs> it's not far away either, you know, and that's something that, and you know, if a film can do that, then it's doing something very right. Um, and I, I also love the Pole Express song itself, you know, I love the bum, on the Polar Express. I love how exciting uh, Tom Hanks, I love how excited he sounds when he sings the song, and again, Tom Hanks can sing. I 
personally haven't seen him sing in any of the movies. So when he sings in this film, I'm like, yeah, he sings it really well. And I love how he actually recorded songs for the soundtrack itself. And I love Tom Hanks in this film. And that leads me on to my next point. I do think this film is all just a dream. I think this is. I think this film is one big dream for the main character that we follow. This young kid. I think it's one big dream for him because at the start of the film he goes to bed and then I think he's meant to fall asleep. This is how I read the film. He's meant to fall asleep, and as soon as he falls asleep, the Polar Express arrives outside on this snowy road on the lane right outside his house. And then he gets on the Polar Express and he gets the golden ticket. He gets the whole hot chocolate song. He, he hears about people's excitement for Santa and the myths surrounding Santa. Then you get all this stuff on the train, which is just really far-fetched and, you know, it wouldn't happen in real life. Like the kid meeting the man who lives on top of the train, the ghostly man, and all this stuff with... The train, which is basically going on this roller coaster track, and then the train coming into contact with these herds of deer, and then the train going across this really icy lake, which is breaking apart, which is cracking as the train goes over it. Then all the stuff that goes to the North Pole, and the whole film I see as one big dream, um, and I think that. Because we learn at the start of the film, the main character doesn't believe in Santa. I think this is his parents outside of his bedroom reenacting all this stuff that actually happened in the film. Because it is not lost on me that Tom Hanks, I've already mentioned this in the podcast today actually, Tom Hanks voices the father of the main character's family and he voices the conductor on the train, he voices the man on top of the train as well as voicing Santa. He voices all the male adult characters in the film and I that's not lost to me. I do think it's his father and maybe his mother as well, although I think it's mainly his father, outside his bedroom trying to make him believe in Santa again. Because he even say that one little line... Um, when they're tucking him for bed, when they're making sure that the main kid is asleep, they say, I used to be so excited, you know, and I think that belief is all gone. It's something like that. And we do also see over on the film that this kid, the main kid that we follow, has a bunch of magazines in his drawer that prove that Santa isn't real. And I think the whole film is his parents trying to convince him that Santa is real. I think the whole film is one big dream. And I also think if you watch it as one big dream that this main kid is having it enhances your experience i really think it does because it makes you feel like you're on this um christmas dream you're dreaming the night before christmas alongside this main character and that's another reason i love it i mean i can understand why some people may say that may go against my reading of the film. My reading of the film is probably nothing that hasn't been said elsewhere. It's probably nothing that hasn't been said by somebody else in a far better, more cohesive way. But I really think it is meant to be... I think this whole film is meant to represent the idea of Christmas and the dream of Christmas. And I think that's the point of the film. That's where we see this... Polar Express, well, that's, that's why we see the Polar Express, that's how Tom Hanks says it in the film. Uh, that's why we see the Polar Express go on this impossible train ride to get to the North Pole and everything just falls into place for the main characters. You know, it's not a film where you feel like the main characters are ever really in trouble, even so they do get in some peril, they're never really in trouble and the characters are one dimension, I think. It's just a dream taking place in all these kids' heads on the night before Christmas. And I really, I think that um, enhances my view of the film. Because when I watch it, I view it as the dream of Christmas. The dream a child has the night before Christmas. And it does make me feel like a child. And I think this is actually one of Robert Zemeckis' better films because it has this energy to it. I mean, pacing-wise, I have already said, I do think it's a bit all over the place, but I think this is one of his better movies and it has a couple of nods to Back to the Future, one of his, well, to the Back to the Future trilogy, some of his previous films, where whenever you see 
the main female character about to go and do something that she doesn't. The camera zooms in on her and goes, trust me, it's something like that. She says something like that. And it's very similar. And the music that you hear in the background is like, bum, bum, bum. And it's very similar to the music you hear when something happens in Back to the Future. Like when somebody says to Marty McFly, you chicken. And he goes, call me chicken one more time. Every time he says, call me chicken one more time in the Back to the Future trilogy, by the way, I get goosebumps. I know he says it far too many times in the second film. I still love it. But yeah, you can tell this is Robert Zemeckis' film. You can tell this is Robert Zemeckis' film. Also, through the casting of Tom Hanks, who cast in plenty of his films. And I like that about it. I do actually think it has this sort of Spielberg in touch to it, because Robert Zemeckis is good friends with Spielberg, and they work together on the Back to the Future trilogy, which Spielberg produced, and um, 1941, which I know many people don't love, but still, they did work together on that. Um, but yeah, I think that... This film has this Spielbergian kind of childlike wonder to it, and um, I think that is through the direction of Robert Zemeckis, which actually makes this film work. This film is, I do think, a little bit of an anomaly to me. An, did I say that word correctly? An anomaly. An anomaly? An anomaly. That's what I was trying to say there. An anomaly. I do think this film is an anomaly to me because. Maybe not an anomaly, maybe that's not what I'm trying to say, but I don't know. I think if I watched this film at a very different point in my life, I would absolutely detest it. I would think it's one of the worst Christmas films of all time. And I can understand again why people don't like it. I completely understand why. But I watched it at a young age, and for me, it got me so excited for Christmas morning. Watching this on a Christmas Eve one night. I don't know, like 10, 11 or 12 years ago. And then going to bed and having my heart pounding and having my excitement on another level. I don't think I slept that night before Christmas after watching this film because of what it did to me, what it did to my younger self. And when I watch it again now, even so I'm at a much older age, I feel like a kid again. And if a Christmas film makes you feel like a kid again and makes you get excited for Christmas and makes you believe in Santa as this film does for me, then I think it is doing its job pretty well. <laughs> to say the least. I think it's doing its job pretty damn well at that, actually. So, yeah, I absolutely love this film. Not because it's a well-made film, not because it's particularly great, but because of what it means to me. And I try and watch this every Christmas, whether it's before Christmas, on Christmas Day, which I have done a couple of times, or whether it's just after Christmas. I remember one year I watched it on Boxing Day. On, I think even one year I watched it on the 27th of Christmas. Or I might even watch them put the Christmas decoration down, which was a little depressing. But anyway, yes. Um, <laughs> for me, this... I try and watch this film every year at Christmas. I absolutely adore it. Even though so it has so many problems, I love the musical score, love the musical elements, love the Polar Express song, love the hot chocolate song, love when Tom Hanks goes, the Polar Express! I love all that. And I just, oh, I think the film is wonderful. I think for me, it encapsulates everything I love about Christmas in one film. And that's still today why I absolutely adore it. And so, all in all, I'm going to say that the Polar Express, I'm going to say that it's an 8 out of 10. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10, not because of its quality film-wise, but because of my affection towards it, again, as I keep saying, but because of my affection towards it um, and of how much it means to me. You know, of how much it really means to me as a Christmas movie. And I think the whole idea of this being a kid's dream is really represented in the imaginative side to the film, which I absolutely love. You know, seeing all these Christmassy elements and seeing them done in such an imaginative way makes me smile. And I think that's another reason that it takes place in the kid's head, because of how imaginative and how creative the film is you know i've never seen another film like this and i don't think i ever will maybe for that be for better or for worse but i have never seen another film like this and yeah that's another reason i absolutely adore it it's one of those staple christmas films you watch every year you know if you're 
a lot of people for a lot of people that's elf for a lot of people that's a, it's a wonderful life and for a lot of people that's muppet's christmas carol and muppet's christmas carol i watch every year as well and for a lot of people that's die hard which by the way die hard is a christmas movie if you say otherwise you're an idiot. But anyway, yeah, for a lot of people, you know, when they have those annual Christmas movies, you can tell how much they mean to people. Paul Express is one of them for me. I mean, I have other annual Christmas films, sure. And I have other annual Christmas rewatches. Like, every Christmas, I'll always rewatch the Gavin and Stacey Christmas specials. I'll always rewatch certain Doctor Who Christmas specials. I'll always rewatch the Black Mirror Christmas special. And I'll always rewatch certain other Christmas films. I normally end up rewatching Elf, although it's not, it doesn't hold quite that special place in my heart because I didn't watch it until, I didn't watch it the first time until a couple of years ago. And I normally rewatch it as a wonderful life. And I usually rewatch, in fact, I almost certainly rewatch Muppets Christmas Carol and all that sort of stuff. But I always make a note of rewatching Polar Express. At least I try to because. I just love the look of the film too. I mean, I don't mean the CGI animation, but the colours, the colour palette of the film, and all the horror elements as well, which is one thing I haven't mentioned. I think the best Christmas films have a bit of horror to them and uh, make you feel a bit unnerved at times. You know, and I do think the film has that. And I just adore the musical score to pieces. That is one of the reasons this film means so much to me. The musical score itself is magnificent. It, it's just perfect. I can listen to that score outside of the film and I'm back into the world of Polar Express and then it's Christmas for me as well. It's just a perfect musical score. And the film itself is for me like one big roller coaster, like one big ride on the Polar Express. It has problems, the CG animation hasn't held up well, pacing wise is all over the place. And it's not a great film, and I can completely understand why people might dislike it. But for me, it held a special place in my heart, because I watched it for the first time about ten years ago on Christmas Eve, and it got me so excited for Christmas morning, and I watch it as a child's dream the night before Christmas. And when I do that, it gets it gets me excited for Christmas again. It makes me feel like a kid around Christmas. I believe in the myth of Santa once I watch this film, and I, I just think it's... I don't know. I For me... It perfectly encapsulates Christmas, and that is why I love it. I love this film, even though I know it's not great. I just adore it to pieces. And so, all in all, as what he said, I'm going to say once more that the Polar Express is an 8 out of 10 for me. Anyway guys, that is it for today's podcast. If you if you do enjoy Polar Express, please let me know your thoughts on why you enjoy it in the comment section below. Or maybe you despise Polar Express. And if you do, that's completely fair and understandable. And please let me know why you might in the comment section below as well. Whatever your thoughts are on the Polar Express, please let me know in the comment section below. And um, thank you for sticking with me by, by the way today. Because you may have noticed my voice is a bit off today because I'm not feeling that well <laughs> I'm really my head is spinning and as soon as this podcast finishes I'm gonna go and lie down on that bed over there probably fall asleep instantly so thank you for sticking with me on this podcast and hopefully it's been enjoyable and hopefully been it an entertaining podcast at the very least so yes thank you for sticking with me and as always, thank you for watching or listening to this podcast. And if you haven't yet, please click down below and like and subscribe on this podcast. And look forward to many more podcasts coming very, very soon on this channel. As I said, thank you so much for watching or listening to this podcast. And I suppose this is it. So I will see you guys again soon. But bye for now. Bye.